to welcome you back for part two of my Squashing the Markets podcast with Ron Suber. We are talking fintech and all things related, and I'm delighted to continue the conversation with Ron here at the StockTwits headquarters in New York City. Good to see you again, Bill. Switching to a more, more personal view, when, when you buy stocks, um, and I'm not asking for recommendations at all, but what's the process you go through before you make an investment? So I'm a passive investor, so I actually don't own any individual stocks. I think everybody, your listeners included, need a investment policy statement. And it's a statement that talks about their thoughts on the market, their risk, their liquidity needs, their assets and liabilities. And when you have a personal investment policy statement, it helps you guide your allocations, your dollars and equities, your dollars and bonds, your cushion, whether you're barbelled whether you're doing private equity. I think that's really important. I think the second thing each investor needs to have is before they buy or sell something, write it down. What are they thinking? Why are they thinking? So later, if it goes up or down, a winner or loser, they can look back at that piece of paper that guided them to that decision to buy or sell that stock or bond or ETF. For me, that's been a great education for both winners and losers and things I passed on that worked where I went back and I read what I wrote that day and I just learned I was wrong or I might have gotten lucky in doing a trade or not. That's really great advice and very it's a good discipline and it can guide you both on the buy and the sell discipline as well. If something achieves its goal, maybe you should maybe it's time to sell it and the ones you miss. So despite the the drawdowns in those four companies we mentioned earlier and some of these fintechs First of all, that's not emblematic of the whole fintech marketplace of publicly traded companies. We've seen a lot of financial technology companies perform extraordinarily well over the last five and 10 years. And even this year to date, a lot of the exchanges, wealth management type companies, uh, online broker dealers, et cetera, there's, 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 a, there's much more than these companies out there. But despite some of these lousy results from the hyped IPOs, Venture capitalists have shown no slowdown in their appetite for investing in early stage, whether it's seed or A or B round, or even later stage private companies operating in the fintech arena. What are they seeing? So we could pick out a few examples, whether it's transportation or lodging, or we could pick one like a DocuSign. So I was an early investor in DocuSign and an advisor to the company. There was no doubt in my mind that the world was going to go paperless in wealth management, in banking, in mortgage, in everything that we do. All of these agreements, this concept of chopping down a tree, making paper, signing paper, FedExing paper, faxing paper, that was an easy one. And many of the big venture capitalists saw that too. But that was a very difficult eight-year run from DocuSign building that company to finding a new CEO when the first CEO wanted to do something else and then take it public. And there were lots of wiggles and wobbles and air pockets along the way. But the venture capitalists who saw that and stuck with that stock made a very big return. It's now a $10 billion company, plus or minus. So there are some great ideas, great companies that venture capitalists are investing in that are capturing the secular change, the generational change that we have. You could talk about salesforce.com or the cloud companies or security companies, the venture capitalists are investing in these things because they are issues that are not going away. These are big opportunities, people storing data to going to the cloud, lots of money to be made there. That trade is not over. So one of the differences then between a venture capital investor, obviously, and a public markets investor or trader at the other end of the spectrum is the time horizon of the investment. Venture capitalists can afford to wait. They have five, 10, 15 year cycles, as you just mentioned, to get the payback on their investment. Whereas you and I, maybe people are saving for college, retirement, wedding, whatever it might be, don't necessarily have that time horizon in mind. That's right. And that's why having an investment policy statement where you can say this is 40 year retirement money. What's the theme? What's the index? What's the region? What's the company that I want to invest in? And this will be held forever till I retire or for some other purpose. But that's right. Investors need to understand if you have a one or two or three or five year horizon, you're investing in a very different way in different companies 
than you are with a much longer horizon. So when we think about fintech and a lot of the VCs that have invested in these companies, who are the the VCs that you think public market investors should pay attention to? In other words, who's been making compelling, interesting, sound investments in private companies where there's been some wins, where you say, wow, when when so-and-so invests, I need to just pay attention because it probably is going to impact all these public markets, public markets companies out there in the environment. Who, who do you pay attention to? So that's like you asking me who my favorite child is, right? And you kind of <laughs> love them all. But the answer is my personal favorite is Sequoia. These are very smart people driven to win, looking globally at some amazing opportunities. I have been lucky to be, have, have been backed twice by Sequoia, once at Merlin and once at Prosper, and I'm invested in the Sequoia funds. They are a special group of people and entrepreneurs and investors. I work very closely with a lot of the VCs, Excel, Andreessen, IVP, Crosslink, and many more. So there are some very talented organizations, but if you make me pick one, I would say it's Sequoia. I, I think you can pick all of them. You didn't have to single them out. Um, you can still love all your children. As an investor, as a public markets investor, it's pretty easy, right? You can go onto their websites and look at their portfolios. They often publicize what they've invested in. And then you can draw conclusions from that about what areas of fintech are most compelling and where they see the growth. That's right. And a lot of times they're buying more stock in the IPO or holding it. And so I think you're right. There is interesting information there if that's how you invest. As I said, I don't do it that way. I'm passive, but you could definitely look and see what they still own. Well, we still have a few people at StockTwits, I believe, who invest on their own and buy, buy stocks from time to time. When you think about the fintech landscape, what are the areas today that interest you the most that you think have the most compelling growth profiles going forward? So one of the themes that I'm investing in and studying and learning and tracking is this whole gig economy. Freelancers, whether it's musicians or construction people or security people or video people, this part of our economy is growing very rapidly. And when, not if, but when the next recession or downturn comes and unemployment goes up and people are fired from their daily jobs, they will become independent contractors and freelancers and gig workers. And so how do we solve in the fintech world the issues these people have? They have different payroll issues because they don't have a regular paycheck. They may need to borrow money for two weeks before the job is done and the invoice is paid. Insurance is different. Everything's different for these people, these gig workers. And so I've invested in a company that solves for the layer between these gig workers and their money. And that company is private. It just raised a big round of venture capital. It's not announced yet, but I'm spending a lot of time working to solve for the needs, borrowing, saving, lending, payroll, cash flow, insurance, and everything for this group the gig economy. I think we can't talk about fintech. We're going to shift gears here a little bit, but I don't think you can talk about fintech today without talking about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin for a little bit. Can you give us some overview thoughts there on this new type of asset, whether it is an asset or a currency or what do you think it is? Is it a fad? Is it here to stay? So when the internet came out, and people tried to understand what is this www dot something thing? What is this email thing? What is this internet HTTP what? Everybody thought it was about email, but it really was about Amazon and Facebook and YouTube and eBay and changing the way everything works on the internet. The analogy here is distributed ledger. Everybody thinks it's about the coin, about the crypto coin, this crypto asset. It's not. Think of the crypto thing like email. It's just the beginning of a big, big new thing, which is the distributed ledger. So my point to you is don't focus on the coin because the winning coin doesn't even exist today. It's coming soon. You may have a Disney coin or an Amazon coin or a JP Morgan coin where we use these coins for a real purpose. These are not investment vehicles, things you buy to make money on, but the real value of the distributed ledger is coming. So think about everything we do. All our healthcare records should be in a distributed ledger and we give the keys to the ledger to our dentist, to our doctor, to our pharmacist so they can see 
the truth, the path, the path and pattern and path of our healthcare. If we want to go buy a piece of art, there should be a distributed ledger. Where was it painted? Who was the painter? Was it ever fixed? Was it ever sold? Same with your wine and, and your whiskey and all those things you buy should be on the ledger. To me, that's where the value of this whole thing is not in the coin per se. Which raises a lot of questions about security because we've seen dozens and dozens of hacks within Bitcoin, stolen money, and nobody knows where the hell it goes. You know, when you start talking about healthcare records and things like that. There's certainly a lot of sensitivity around it. Do we have the capability to safeguard this information? Absolutely. Even though you've seen like last week, I guess Capital One, you know, just another million social security numbers out there floating around now. It's a problem. It's not going away, but we can solve for this. And I think that the chain, the distributed ledger is part of the answer to that problem. Let's just shift gears. My, This is really my... Uh, my final question uh, about fintech per se, let's talk about regulatory environment and what's on the minds of regulators right now in the U.S. I know you've had lots of conversations with them over the years and interactions. We've seen in other countries, quote unquote, fintech sandboxes being created or special regulations around fintechs to encourage innovation in financial services. What's going on here in the, in the U.S. right now with respect to fintech? What's the general environment? So when I travel and meet the regulators from around the world, there's usually one or two. For example, in Singapore, it's the MAS, right? The Monetary Authority of Singapore. When I go to China, there's the PBOC. When I go to Europe, there's one or two regulators. Here in the US, there are seven, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I would argue yeah. there are more. 57, I would Correct. think, right? There are actually <laughs> the state, all the states, plus FTC, FDIC, SEC, right? All the different groups. So it's very hard here to try to do business in all these states and deal with all the different states. And every two years, there's new regulators in each state, and they may or may not want to change things or redo things. The, the regulators are definitely trying to get ahead of this ball, ahead of the curve, and protect the consumer from Ponzi schemes, from fraud, and really from abuse. And you're seeing the regulators crack down on some of these fintechs who are getting a little too cute and trying to step around the laws and it's really not to the benefit of the consumer so i've been working very proactively with regulators and the sandboxes and you've seen the regulators join the sandboxes to create safe areas where fintechs and incumbents can work together with data to try to come up with better solutions for consumers but they have an important role here and we need to make sure we are proactive and communicate with them before there's a problem do you think the recent crackdown on earn in which is a, a fintech company with a close to billion dollar valuation, I believe, is indicative of where the regulators are heading? Or is that a, a kind of a one off case? So I won't comment specifically about that company, but I think there's more of that to come where the regulators are seeing that these fintechs really, uh, not that one in particular, aren't doing a service for the consumer. And it's not clear and it has to be. Trust and transparency are critical. It takes years to earn this and just a moment or two to lose it. And I think the regulators need to keep doing these things to keep everybody honest for the benefit of the consumer. Just in general, what advice do you give, would you give to public market investors about investing in fintech stocks in particular? You've talked about some general investment statements, some general advice about investing overall. But what is it about fintechs that people should be looking for, analyzing, reading, et cetera? So I caution every investor about getting into private investments. It's easy to get in, it's hard to get out. There isn't liquidity in lots of these companies. Number two, it's really about the entrepreneur, their IQ, their EQ, their emotional quotient, their emotional intelligence, and their AQ, their adversity quotient, their resilience and grit. If you can find the right entrepreneur who has the right business model, the right team, the right culture, mission, vision, and values, and can execute, and do good for the consumer and make the debt work and the equity work and find a way to make money, there may be a way to have a 10 or 20x return and get liquidity. But there's a lot of losers along the way that nobody talks about. And there are a lot of overnight successes that took 10 years. So I'm very cautious to investors about getting into private. And that's the private. But let's talk about public markets. I know you don't invest in, in uh, 
you're a passive investor in terms of public equities. But when you look at fintech, would you say some of those same characteristics hold for public companies like the the, the leadership team, management quality, et cetera, the business model? We talked about customer acquisition. Are those, are those the basic things that people should be looking at? I do. And so I would say to the listeners, and I don't give financial advice, I'm not a broker. If you believe in the cloud, you can invest in an ETF that has all 40 cloud companies. If you believe in security or robotics, there are ETFs that have all of them and you can just buy that ETF that owns them all. So you don't have to pick what you think the winner is. And so I would just say, if you like the theme FinTech, there are FinTech indices or funds or ETFs that own lots of FinTechs. That may be a way to get exposure in the public markets to the sector if you like it without having to try to figure out which stock you think is the winner. So last thing, and I'm going to make this part of all my podcasts, but we're going to do a little lightning round and I'm going to give you 10 comparisons. You need to pick your favorite out of the two choices that I'm going to give you. You don't need to say why, but no fudging. Um, So here we go. Stash or Acorns? Acorns. Venmo or Zelle? Venmo. Robinhood or E-Trade? E-Trade. Lending Club or Goldman Sachs Marcus? Marcus. Bitcoin or gold? Bitcoin. Uber or Lyft? Lyft. Warren Buffett or Howard Marks? Howard Marks. Hedge funds or ETF? ETFs. Venture capital or private equity? Venture capital. New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ? NASDAQ. Thank you, Ron Suver. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Great to see you, Bill. Bill.